Okay, good afternoon. I can see there are a few people joining, so I will get started. Um, thank you for joining us. My name is Amelia Ramsey. I am the Confiscations and Proceeds of Crime Partner at Dugan George Lawyers. Today, we are kicking off our webinar series on anti-money laundering and the Commonwealth Proceeds of Crime Act. Over the next six months, on behalf of Dugan George, I'll be hosting talks on issues central to practicing in this area. Australia has placed an increased emphasis on anti-money money laundering in the recent years, as a lot of you will know. The regulatory focus is intensifying, leading to more stringent monitoring, reporting and enforcement measures. This heightened scrutiny means that financial institutions and businesses face rigorous compliance requirements. It also means uh, that more people are being investigated and charged with financial crimes relating to the issues of leading to the issues of restraining orders under both the federal and state schemes. Understanding how to effectively navigate these schemes is critical to our clients. To help us with that, I'd like to introduce today's presenter, Christian Jubner of King's Council. I've been very fortunate to work with Christian on a number of matters arising from charges of tax evasion, fraud and money laundering. Christian came to the bar in 2004. Before that, he was a partner in the mergers and acquisitions team of Deacons, now Norton Rose Fulbright. Christian took silk in 2022 and has since been recognised by Doyles in the category of commercial and commercial litigation and dispute resolution, Senior Counsel Victoria. Whilst Christian principally has a commercial litigation practice, he is also known as an expert in proceeds of crime litigation. This year, Christian was recognised by Doyles in the category Leading White Collar Criminal Law and Regulatory Investigation Barrister Australia 2024. He is a member of the Confiscation and Proceeds Crime List Users Group of the Supreme Court of Victoria and the County Court of Victoria. Today, Christian is going to step us through an overview of the legislation that establishes the federal scheme to confiscate proceeds of crime, the Proceeds of Crime Act 2002. So I'll just hand over to you, Christian. Thank you very much, Amelia, and thank you everybody for joining us this afternoon. Um, I know it's difficult to find time to do these things, but uh, I appreciate you attending. Um, a little bit about the structure of my presentation. Um, let me just start the slides. Um, I, I'm going to, at the start, just provide a little bit of an overview of um, the um, Proceeds of Crime Act with some introductory comments. Then I'll, I'm going to address what might be regarded as some misconceptions um, in litigating under the Proceeds of Crime Act. And then I want to deal with some practical issues and uh, address the three stages, that's how I see it, of litigation under the Proceeds of Crime Act. And I'll try and keep that practical as best I can. But just by way of some introductory comments, the Proceeds of Crime Act has now been in force for about 22 years, but there's definitely been a, a significant increase in litigation in the last 11 or 12 so years, particularly since the AFP took over the uh, conduct as Proceeds of Crime Authority in 2011. As you probably will know, the investigative work under the Proceeds of Crime Act is done by the what's called the Confiscation Asset sorry, the Criminal Asset Confiscation Task Force, which is made up of four different government agencies. The first is the AFP, the second is the ATO, the third is AUSTRAC, and then Border Force. Uh, and it, it may well be that the involvement of the ATO in the task force explains the increase in litigation in relation to tax matters or duty matters, such as um, the importation of alcohol and tobacco in connection with excise evasion. The legal work under the Proceeds of Crime Act for the AFP is done in-house by what's called the CAL team or Criminal Asset Litigation Team. It's effectively an in-house legal department of the AFP. The um, people often ask what happens to the money that's forfeited under the Proceeds of Crime Act and, and in short it goes into uh, a confiscated asset account and is then applied to various um, Commonwealth project, for example, the National DNA project or human trafficking projects. Um, it's worth noting that the Proceeds of Crime Act litigation is now a quite a significant practice area in its own right. Certainly, that's my experience in Victoria, New South Wales, 
and South Australia. Um, in the annual report of the AFP that was published for the 2023 year, it set out that in 2019, the AFP commissioner set a five-year target to restrain $600 million worth of assets. But as at 30 June 2023, the CACT task force had restrained in excess of $940 million in assets and that in the 2023 financial year, there was a return on investment of 2.6. That means for every dollar spent, $2.60 was generated through the forfeiture of assets. In 2023, there was a total of $68.7 million in forfeited assets. So this, this is a significant practice area, so much so that the Supreme Court of Victoria and also the County Court of Victoria have now introduced specialised lists that deal with proceeds of crime. Um, the confiscation list in the County Court, for example, sits on a weekly basis. The Supreme Court sits, depending on how busy it is, between fortnightly or monthly. And it's also worth noting that the litigation under the Proceeds of Crime Act commonly involves high stakes, that is, high stakes in terms of the value of the assets. Usually it involves houses, um, significant amounts in bank accounts, uh, often expensive vehicles, shares, cash or cryptocurrency. Now, I want to start off really by talking about some misconceptions. And I'm, I'll, I'll, there are four particular misconceptions. The first is that forfeiture is limited to proceeds of crime. It's not. Forfeiture can occur also in respect of what is described as an instrument of crime. Um, an instrument is something that is used in or in connection with the commission of an offence, regardless of whether it's been generated from the commission of an offence. And there's a there's a, a good example of that in practice, the case of Cheney, CINI and the AFP. That was a case where Mr Cheney had lived in his house in Altona Meadows um, for over 30 years and he had I think he'd taken that house as part of a separation of his marriage and there hadn't been a mortgage over that property for many, many years. Mr. Cheney was convicted of importing methamphetamine, uh, which had been imported from China in some truck tyres. When the, when the drugs were imported, they were stored initially at a warehouse and there was some word that the warehouse was to be robbed and Mr. Cheney with his son decided to move the drugs for a short period of time to Mr. Cheney's home in Altona Meadows um, whilst they looked for another location where to store them. The, the drugs were um, driven by car to Mr. Cheney's home, put into a shed in the backyard for about 24 hours and the next day they were taken away again and subsequently the property was restrained and the question arose whether the property was used in or in connection with the commission of a relevant offence. The case, the county court decided that um, the property was to be forfeited and on appeal in the Court of Appeal, the, the central question was, what's the level of connection required between the use of a property um, and, the, uh, and the offending, particularly in circumstances here where Mr Cheney hadn't been charged in relation to the possession of the drugs at his home. And the court found that notwithstanding the fact that we did the best we could to argue that the property had been used only for a very short space of time and also a very small part of the property had physically been used and Mr Cheney had owned the property for 30 years and it would result in a very, what we described as a disproportionate outcome, the court found that there was still a sufficient connection and the connection between the use of the property and the offending did not need to be substantial as long as there was some connection. Um, and as a result, uh, Mr. Cheney lost his property. Uh, and I use that example um, to highlight the fact that not only proceeds of crime are forfeited, but also instruments of crime. The second misconception is that um, forfeiture will only happen if there's a conviction. That is not so. In fact, the Proceeds of Crime Act in section 51 expressly states 
The fact that a person has been acquitted of an offence with which the person has been charged does not affect the court's power to make a forfeiture order under sections 47 or 49 to the, in relation to the offence. And, and that is so because um, a different standard of proof applies and a different onus of proof applies as well. So the fact that someone is acquitted does not mean the property is not at risk of forfeiture and there are certainly examples including the case of Safadi where there was an acquittal but subsequently forfeiture occurred by forfeiture order. The third misconception and this is one in particularly dangerous for solicitors uh, who, who have to understand if you're going to practice in this area the time frames that apply for filing applications but the third misconception is this that filing an application for exclusion will stop forfeiture from occurring Whilst that is so under the Confiscation Act 1997, which is the Victorian legislation, that is not the case under the Proceeds Crime Act. If you have, if you're dealing with a Section 18 restraining order, which is, uh, and I'll explain what that is shortly, but if you're dealing with a Section 18 restraining order, which is a suspect based restraining order, and there is a conviction of that suspect of a serious offence, all of the property that is the subject of restraint will be automatically order forfeited to the Commonwealth six months after the date of the conviction. That six month period can be extended to a maximum of 15 months under the Act, but any application for extension must be made within the original six month period. Um, and if it's not made, then uh, it's too late. There is no there's no ability to then recover the property. And almost certainly if there was some prospect that the property could be saved. If you're a solicitor, you'll be ringing your insurer. Um, this creates, can I say, some practical difficulties with litigating under the Proceeds of Crime Act in busy courts for this reason. A Proceeds of Crime proceeding, or well, the trial will often be a trial of five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten days. Quite often interpreters are involved and it might even take longer. Um, if you only start preparing that case from the date of the conviction. And given the fact that you need to get to a final order within 15 months, assuming you get the extension, that is a tight time frame. It might not seem tight, but it is tight. Um, you, you have to first prepare the evidence, uh, including sometimes um, a significant forensic analysis to trace flows of funds. That sometimes involves um, experts. That takes time. After you serve your evidence, the AFP may very well seek to examine uh, the applicant for exclusion and others. That also takes time. And it's, it's important to observe that the AFP has to be given a reasonable opportunity to conduct those examinations before any exclusion application is heard. And only after those examinations are conducted will the AFP usually put on its evidence in response and then at some stage, you probably seek to reply to that evidence as well. And given that's all going to take more than 12 months, there's going to be at least one end of year vacation period between sometime in December and January where very little happens. And before you know it, you're getting close to your 15 month time frame, and you have to have the final order made within that 15 month time frame, otherwise it's all over. And th there are a number of decisions where the judge, the judgments start with something like, um, I made an order on that day. These are now the reasons. I made the order because it was urgent. <laughs> um, but in short, if you were dealing with a with a matter um, where you filed an application for exclusion and there's been a conviction of a serious offence, what you should do at an early stage is get a trial date locked in, in sufficient time to allow the judge to consider it, reserve and hand down reasons within the 16 month period to make final or 15 month period within um, and to make the final order. If you if you don't do that early on in the process, there's every chance that you will not then get your matter heard and determined in time. Um, there is an, there are a number of examples of cases where people have um, attempted after the 15 month period to try and have their assets returned. And in short, it's not possible. Uh, there's court of appeal authority to that effect in New South Wales. The fourth misconception is that restrained assets can be used to pay legal costs. Um, that's often a big surprise, not for those who've been practicing in the area for a while, but certainly for clients. 
because there's a big distinction between, for example, freezing orders in the civil space, which I've, I've done many, um, but in, in those types of cases, the standard order provides for a, a carve out of for the payment of reasonable legal costs and often for reasonable living expenses as a standard carve out from from which the court proceeds right from the commencement but here in the proceeds of crime space there is no such carve out for legal costs in fact section 24 subsection 2 ca expressly says that if a variation is sought of a restraining order for the payment of reasonable living and business expenses the court must be satisfied that none of the funds are to be used towards legal expenses either for the proceeds of crime proceeding or for the criminal proceeding which of course places a very significant amount of pressure on those seeking to have their assets unfrozen particularly if they're at the same time also dealing with um, a criminal proceeding now these are they were the misconceptions now let's get into the practical um, work under the Act. Um, as I said before, I think there are effectively three phases to litigating under the um, Proceeds of Crime Act. The first phase, which um, I might say is the first 28 days after you um, are provided with a restraining order, and I'll explain in a moment why it's 28 days. Phase two is what I call the holding pattern. Um, that is a time where you try and create an atmosphere that allows you to or allows your client to maintain their position until such time as the litigation is ultimately resolved, which in many cases can be years away, particularly if someone is charged with criminal offences and it's sought not to run any proceeds of crime um, applications until the criminal matter is resolved. And phase three is what I call the property recovery stage, that is, um, the pursuit of applications for exclusion orders, um, compensation orders and opposing forfeiture orders. So phase one, um, what to do in phase one? Phase one usually starts with your client ringing you saying, um, I've been served with a restraining order. Um, what is that? Um, the first thing you need to do is to explain to the client what the effect of a restraining order is. Um, it's, it is a form of statutory injunction. It's to preserve the status quo pending potential forfeiture of all of the restrained property at some future point in time. So everything that's restrained is at risk of forfeiture, but of course it isn't forfeited at the time of restraint. It's simply sought to preserve the status quo. But you need to explain to your client, for example, that dealing in restrained property is an offence and dealing includes the obvious, that is selling something um, or creating a mortgage or other encumbrance over it would be an offence. But there are also less obvious types of dealings, for example, reducing the value of a restrained asset by, for example, redrawing against an existing um, line of credit that is secured against a property that's the subject of a restraining order that would reduce the equity in the property and that would be a dealing. Likewise, and I've come across this a few times, inadvertently restrained properties which are rented out, um, the, the, the estate agents or, or the clients renew the, uh, the uh, residential lease. Strictly speaking, that's also a breach because it's creating an interest in property. So it's important that clients understand that um, what they mustn't do as a result of the making of a restraining order. The penalty for a contravention is imprisonment for up to five years or 300 penalty units. So it's a serious offence to breach a restraining order. There are different types of restraining orders. And one of the first things you need to do is understand what type of restraining orders in fact been made. Uh, the most common are section 18 and 19 orders. I'll mostly address those. The, so firstly, section 18 is a restraining order where you have what's called a suspect someone who's um, suspected of have, having committed a particular offence. So it's it's an order by reference to an individual where an authorised officer, that is someone who's made the affidavit in support of the application for the restraining order, suspects on reasonable grounds that the, sp the suspect has committed certain offences. It's not necessary that the suspect has been charged with those offences. Sometimes they have been, sometimes they haven't been. That is because the threshold for obtaining the restraining order is of course 
much lower than that which one would hope would govern when someone is or isn't charged. It is merely a re reasonable grounds to suspect that a certain offence has um, been uh, certain offence has been committed. What can be restrained under a Section 18 order, or for that matter, under a well, firstly under Section 18 order, all of the property of the suspect, that is anything that's owned by the suspect, can be restrained, but also um, property under what's called the effective control of the suspect can be restrained. And um, classic case of effective control is, for example, a suspect who is the sole director of a company, a sole shareholder of a company uh, that has owns real estate or motor vehicles or bank accounts. Um, in those circumstances, there'd be um, little standing in the way of those assets also being the subject of restraint. Section 19 restraining orders are a different creature. They are not focused on an individual having um, or being suspected of having committed offences. They are um, they focus on the characteristics of the property sought to be restrained. That is, there have to be reasonable grounds to suspect that the property sought to be restrained is either proceeds of a particular offence or an instrument of a particular type of offence. Um, the expressions proceeds and instruments I'll come back to in due course in some more detail, but this of course is an, an order that's not focused on a particular person having committed a particular type of offence. And in fact, it's not even necessary to get a Section 19 restraining order for the Commissioner of the Australian Federal Police to point to a particular person having committed an offence. It is only necessary to point to there being reasonable grounds to suspect that certain property has these particular characteristics. There are many instances where properties restrained under both a Section 18 and a Section 19 order. That was the subject of a challenge in a case called Song and AFP heard by Justice Forbes in Victoria, but Justice Forbes determined that there's nothing inappropriate or, 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 or impermissible, I should say, about restraining property under both sections. So um, that seems to be the way it goes with many of the restraining orders. But it's important to be mindful of the type of restraining order that is that you're dealing with because a section 18 restraining order is the only type of restraining order that can lead to automatic forfeiture occurring upon the conviction of a serious offence, which I'll explain and I'll explain how that happens in a little bit later on. Um, the third type of restraining order, which um, gets a disproportionate amount of attention from the media, but at, at the same time is hardly ever, in fact, um, uh, the subject of any litigation is what's called a literary proceeds restraining order. And it's really the type of restraining order that might be obtained where someone tries to exploit their notoriety um, for the, um, which they've gained through criminal conduct to generate, um, to generate an income. A good example, I think, was the book written by Chappelle Corby. The next thing you should check when you first um, take instructions uh, in relation to a new matter is whether or not an undertaking as to damages has been given. Now, um, almost always these days, an undertaking as to damages is given, but um, there is yet a matter to be unresolved about that, at least in my view. Section 21 of the Proceeds of Crime Act expressly provides that the court may refuse to make a restraining order if the Commonwealth refuses or fails to give the court an appropriate undertaking with respect to the payment of damages or costs or both for the making and operation of the order. Now, for those who are involved in this litigation, I have not in the many years I've done this seen a, restra a restraining order with an undertaking to pay costs, notwithstanding the fact that the Act expressly provides for that. In fact, the undertakings that are generally given also seek to carve out um, damages in respect of any person who might be in any way involved in the offending. In my view, there's authority, at least in the ACT, that's contrary to the, those types of orders being made and there will probably at some stage be a vehicle where this will be the subject of some challenge. In any event, I simply point that out um, as to whether or not 
um, you should check the adequacy of the undertaking because that ultimately is the only way in which to make a recovery should it turn out down the track that the order um, or that you're successful in having property excluded and someone has consequently suffered loss. The next thing you should check is satis you should check the evidentiary requirements have been satisfied. An affidavit in support of a restraining order application must be made by, by an authorised officer. That includes uh, an AFP member as defined in section 338. For section 18 purposes, or that's the section 18 order, it must state that the authorised officer suspects that someone has permitted, committed certain offences. Um, under section 19, it must state that there are reasonable grounds to suspect that certain properties are the proceeds or an instrument of a serious offence. Now, there was an interesting appeal. In fact, Amelia uh, and I were involved in that together with other me members of her firm, including Bill Doog, um, that we ran in the first instance then in the Court of Appeal and we sought special leave to the High Court, a case called SARD and the Commission of the Australian Federal Police. The question in that case was really what the evidentiary requirement or the standard was necessary to um, prove the relevant suspicion. In that particular affidavit that was used in support of the application for the restraining order, the there was the standard, um, the standard recitation that many of these affidavits commence with. And I'll just read what it says. It says, I make this affidavit from my own knowledge, information and belief obtained in the course of my duties as a member of the AFP. This knowledge, information and belief is from both my own inquiries and inquiries made by other members of the AFP about which I've been informed and which I believe to be true and correct. The sources of information includes files in the possession of the AFP which I've read, evidence, information and documents collected by the AFP which I've examined, information obtained from the Australian Border Force, information obtained from the from Austrac, information obtained from the CBA and information obtained from ASIC. None of that identified the particular source or the type of information obtained. And under section 75 of the Evidence Act, the hearsay rule, that is, I mean, it's obviously hearsay, the hearsay rule doesn't apply in an interlocutory application if the party adducing the evidence also adduces evidence of the source of the evidence. So we contended that this was all inadmissible on the basis that the source of the evidence hadn't been exposed. And that was consistent with the majority judgment in international finance in New South Wales, where Justice Allsop, or President Allsop, as he was then, had written the um, majority judgment and had determined that in similar circumstances under the New South Wales regime, it was necessary to prove in accordance with the Evidence Act, the grounds that give rise to the suspicion. But um, the Court of Appeal uh, in, in Victoria disagreed and said that because you're not proving facts, you are merely proving a suspicion, there was no requirement to comply with Section 75 of the Evidence Act. Um, of course, you still need to, when you're acting in these matters, check that the grounds are properly articulated and that there is a basis disclosed in the affidavit for the suspicion. But probably the decision of SAD has lowered the bar somewhat um, for obtaining the, um, for, for the evidentiary requirements in respect of restraining orders. There's also seems to be a, a point of difference in practice between New South Wales and Victoria, at least insofar as reasons are concerned. In Victoria, um, there are almost no instances where judges have given reasons for making restraining orders, even made ex parte. Whereas in New South Wales, there is now um, uh, there are a number of authorities um, that effectively make it clear that it is necessary when making ex parte restraining orders for the court to give reasons. Um, it's, it's an unusual diversion of practice. In Victoria, quite often, there's a, re a very brief recitation in other matters, simply identifying the state of satisfaction the judge had reached in making the orders without identifying any underlying reasoning. Um, I said before, I'll say, I, I was going to explain why phase one applies to the first 28 days, and it's for this reason. 
in the first 28 days of being provided with a restraining order, you have to make a decision whether you're going to make a revocation application. A revocation application is an application that the restraining order be revoked. Um, it's different to an exclusion application or a compensation application um, because frankly, it's much more difficult to obtain a revocation application because the applicant for a revocation application must prove um, that there are no grounds on which the restraining order could be made. And bearing in mind that the threshold is suspicion, it is a very low threshold. And it's a very difficult thing to disprove the fact that there is there are no grounds for a suspicion. Importantly, um, when after a restraining order is made, even if it's made ex parte, the revocation is the only way in which the making of that order absent an appeal can be challenged. Um, relevantly, you don't get the right for an inter partes rehearing of the original application under the Proceeds of Crime Act. If this was a civil injunction application brought ex parte, there'd be no doubt about it that the court would make an interim order only, usually for three or four days. And on the return of that interim order, you would have an ability then to contest the continuation of that um, order. And in particular, you would not bear the onus to seek to have a discharge. The onus would rest on the applicant at the inter partes rehearing to maintain the order. The Proceeds of Crime Act reverses that. Once the order is made ex parte on that low threshold of suspicion, the, the ball, um, the ball crosses the court and it's up to those who seek to have it revoked to prove, and it's their onus, that to establish that there are no grounds on which the order can be made. It's very difficult and I think that there are only really a handful of successful revocation application and a mountain of unsuccessful ones. Um, I can think of one example where some jewellery was restrained, but someone was able to show a photo of the jewellery being worn by a particular person at a wedding some years prior to the alleged offending and therefore could show that it couldn't possibly have been acquired with um, unlawful funds. But, but absent some very compelling evidence, they're very difficult. But if you are, if you are acting for somebody involved in proceeds of crime litigation, then I think you need to explain that there is at least the opportunity to make a revocation application. And that application must be made within 28 days. Um, if you can't make a decision within the 28 days, you can make an application within the 28 days for an extension of time within which to make the decision. And you can get up to three months within which to decide whether you should make, whether you wish to make the revocation application. But again, the original application either for revocation or extension of time must be made within 28 days. Otherwise it lapses. There is no ability to extend that time period. After that, we get into phase two. Phase two is what I call creating the holding pattern. Um, for those involved in this litigation, you'll be unsurprised to know that many of these cases take some years to resolve. And one thing that you need to create as early as you can is an ability for things to, um, well, a status quo to be maintained for a period of time while um, you go through the motions, in some cases, first of dealing with a criminal proceeding and then addressing the proceeds of crime proceeding or um, the time it takes to progress the proceeds of crime proceeding. There are a number of things you need to take into account in the holding pattern stage. The first is whether you want to seek an order for variation to be permitted to access um, restrained monies to pay reasonable living expenses. Certainly under section 24, such an application can be made. And in some instances where literally all of the assets are restrained and people don't have the ability to continue to support themselves or their dependents, then such an application should be made. Um, you can also make an application for the payment of reasonable business expenses or the payment of specific debts which have been incurred in good faith. But there is a condition for making such an application and the condition for the exercise of the power by the court is that the applicant has disclosed on oath all of their assets because you need to establish that there are no unrestrained assets available from which you could otherwise pay your living expenses, business expenses or debts. 
in short, the court is not going to permit you to access restrained assets if you have unrestrained assets which are capable of meeting um, those debts. And of course, that sometimes um, that sometimes requires a strategic decision to be made as to whether or not someone wishes to go on oath and disclose um, their position. And of course, it's important for people to understand if they're going to make affidavits, they have to be absolutely truthful. So um, sometimes people choose not to make those applications because they have the support of other family members. Sometimes they have assets that they can still access um, from which they can support themselves. The second type of holding pattern order that are, is often seen is um, an ancillary order under section 39 for the sale of restrained property. Um, particularly when you've got large property pools that have been restrained that are the subject of encumbrances and suddenly um, uh, for one reason or another it's no longer possible to service all of the mortgage pay payments that need to be made. Um, in those instances sometimes it's better to simply to sell some of the restrained property uh, and if that happens the mortgagee is paid out. Um, the surplus funds are paid to the official trustee and held in place of the restrained physical property and one can then argue over the um, over that over the uh, surplus funds in due course. The third thing you need to think about when you're creating a holding pattern is whether or not you should be uh, at some stage seeking to stay the uh, proceeds of crime proceedings if there are concurrent criminal proceedings. And it wouldn't surprise many criminal lawyers to say that um, it's probably not a good idea for um, persons who are charged with serious offences and have had their assets restrained to make affidavits and attend trials and be cross-examined about all sorts of matters before their criminal matter is resolved. Um, there is power under the Proceeds of Crime Act to stay proceedings pending the resolution of criminal proceedings at section 319. But the, the power, I have to say, um, uh, well, I'll put it a different way, um, quite often is the, the application for a stay is quite often met with resistance um, by the commissioner um, and so much so that there was a legislative amendment made some years ago um, following a decision by the High Court to, uh, to make it more difficult for stay orders to be obtained. In short, the fact that there are concurrent criminal proceedings or the, the mere fact of concurrency of criminal proceedings and proceeds of crime proceedings, even if there's a factual overlap, is of itself insufficient to get a stay these days. It's necessary in any application for a stay to address it in a qualitative way, that is to address precisely why it is that the relevant prejudice arises and there is a, a, a risk to the administration of justice if no stay was granted. <clears throat> and there are various matters that the court mustn't take into account now in deciding the question of stay. It's actually quite an interesting space. The county court ordered a stay in a case called Zayna, Z-A-Y-N-E-H, which is now the subject of an appeal by the commissioner uh, and I'm not in fact sure when that's being heard, but it mustn't be far away if it hasn't already been heard, but it certainly hasn't yet been determined. Um, that's that's what, all I want to say at this stage about the holding pattern stage. Now I'll get into phase three, and this is really where most of the action is in this space, that is seeking relief from forfeiture. Um, there are broadly two types of applications that are made to try and prevent forfeiture from occurring. Um, the first is what's called an exclusion application. Um, the second is a compensation application. In fact, I probably should have said there are two types of applications which try and ameliorate the effect of forfeiture because compensation, as I'll explain in a moment, only happens if forfeiture has occurred. But the principal application that people make is what's called an exclusion application. An exclusion application is an application to seek to have restrained property released um, back to the individual, either released from the restraining order or released from a forfeiture order or a prospective forfeiture order, depending on what type of stage the proceeding is at. Importantly, an exclusion application leads to an all or nothing outcome. 
if the applicant satisfies the exclusion test, the whole of the property comes back. If the applicant fails to satisfy some limb of the exclusion test, the property is lost. Um, whereas compensation applications are a different creature, um, where property has been the subject of forfeiture, the court has the power to ameliorate the hardship, that is the ameliorate the um, draconian nature of the all or nothing outcome from an exclusion application by making a compensation application which requires the Commonwealth to make a payment to the applicant in an amount that represents the value of the property that was derived lawfully, shall we say. Um, let's talk first then about exclusion applications. As I said before, there are different stages in proceedings and different types of exclusion applications, but broadly, they require the applicant to establish the following. Firstly, that the property they seek to exclude is not what's defined as proceeds. And secondly, that the property sought to be excluded is not an instrument. And thirdly, that the property is not required to satisfy a pecuniary penalty order. Now, what are proceeds and what is an instrument? Proceeds um, is defined as, um, pro proceeds is, is something that is wholly derived or realised or partly derived or realised from the commission of a particular offence. Whereas an instrument is something that is used in or in connection with the commission of an offence or intended to be used in or in connection with the commission of an offence. And whilst that sounds like a simple test, it's often not easy to satisfy and bearing in mind the applicant has the onus of proof. That is, once the restraining order is made, those seeking to exclude the property bear the onus to show that the exclusion test is satisfied. Um, the the uh, burden of proof is the balance of probabilities or the standard of proof is the balance of probabilities um, because these are, after all, uh, civil proceedings. Um, importantly, when an application for exclusion is made, an applicant must prove the negative. That is, you have to prove that property is not derived from particular offence uh, or any offence for that matter. But the High Court has said, and, and this is where there've, there's been quite a lot of argument uh, in various matters over the last few years, the High Court has said it's not necessary for an applicant for exclusion to negative all different types of criminal uh, activity. They only need to negative that which is positively introduced by the Commissioner. So the first place where the Commissioner introduces particular alleged unlawful conduct is in the affidavit in support of the application for the restraining order. So you have to obviously deal with all of the offences that are the subject of discussion in that affidavit. If the Commissioner wishes to rely upon anything else thereafter, the Commissioner would have to put in a notice of grounds of opposition and relevantly in Victoria under the County Court Miscellaneous Rule, I think it's Rule 10.22, there is an obligation on the Commissioner to put in a notice of grounds identifying any other basis upon which the application is opposed. So it would be up to the Commissioner then to identify any other offences that, um, that are sought to be uh, alleged and that then need to be negative by the applicant for exclusion. Um, when does something cease to be proceeds of crime? Um, this has also been the subject of um, a uh, recent decision by the High Court in a case called Kalamutu. Um, take this example. If I go to the ATM after this uh, presentation and I, this afternoon, take out $50 out of the ATM, and that $50 note was used last week in some drug transaction, is that $50 still proceeds of crime in my pocket? The answer to that obviously is no. And the reason for that is the operation of section 330 subsection four, which provides that property only ceases to be proceeds of an offence or an instrument of, a, of an offence if it is acquired by a third party, that's me at the ATM, for sufficient consideration, that's me at the ATM because my account is debited, without the third party knowing and in circumstances that would not arouse a reasonable suspicion, 
that the property was the proceeds of an offence or an instrument of an offence, as the case requires. So if a third party acquires the property in circumstances where the third party doesn't know and objectively there is there are no reasonable grounds to suspect that this particular property is proceeds of crime, that's the point in time at which the characteristics of proceeds or instruments ceases. But until that time, it continues. Um, and that is important to bear in mind when you're drafting affidavits in support of exclusion applications. Compensation applications, as I mentioned before, um, are a different creature. Compensation applications um, allow the court to make an order to ameliorate the hardship in this way. Um, relevantly, Section 94 capital A says that the, if the court is satisfied that a portion of the value of the applicant's interest was not derived or realised directly or indirectly from the commission of, an, of any offence. So a portion of the value has to be derived effectively lawful, lawfully, then an order can be made for a proportionate repayment. But importantly, if the property is an instrument like Mr Cheney's property was, then it is not possible to get a compensation order. Um, I said before, or touched briefly before on the fact that if an application for exclusion is made, or, or, or even for that matter, a revocation application, the AFP has to be given a reasonable opportunity to conduct um, an examination. And there's certainly been a proliferation of examinations since the decision of the Supreme Court and the, or the Court of Appeal in Victoria in, in Zhang um, some years ago. Um, it is almost now common practice that um, applicants for exclusion orders are the subject of examinations. Those examinations in Victoria occur at the AAT before a presidential member. Um, likewise, I think in New South Wales, that's certainly been my experience. Um, th they are uh, draconian, draconian proceedings in this sense. Um, they're held in private, um, although the applicant or the examinee can have a lawyer present. Um, there are very, um, there are very uh, strict rules as to what is to occur in the course of the examination. Relevantly, all privileges are abrogated. Um, that is, the privilege against self-incrimination is abrogated, as well as legal professional privilege. Now, um, notwithstanding um, that, or, or maybe uh, as the counterbalancing factor, there is a direct use immunity that's conferred on an examinee. That is that the transcript of the examination can be used to prosecute for providing false evidence in the examination, but otherwise cannot be used in a criminal proceeding. But it is very important to understand that the transcript or the product of these compulsory examinations or otherwise compulsory sworn statements is able to be shared with other law enforcement agencies, including prosecutorial agencies under Section 266 capital A of the Proceeds of Crime Act, which expressly permits information sharing. And, and there is what one must do um, when acting for a client who's faced with an examination and is charged with offences, uh, one must seek what's called a quarantine order. The court has power under section 266 capital A to make an order quarantining the product of those compulsory examinations so as to ensure that it is not disclosed to, um, to any other uh, agency um, if the disclosure would come with a risk of prejudice to the administration of justice. There's been a recent decision in our Court of Appeal, Yang and the AFP, where the scope of um, these quarantining orders was considered. Um, I want to leave a little bit of time for questions. So I just, I just want to finish up by saying this. Um, if you're going to work in this space, and I hope you do, and it's interesting work, um, particularly for those who also have an interest in commercial law, because it often intersects with property law, trust law, corporations law, uh, but, but beware of particularly one thing, and they are the strict timelines that apply. Um, the first strict timeline is the 28 days within which you have to make a revocation application. And the second strict timeline is the six months to automatic forfeiture from the date of conviction or, or six months within which to extend time 
to bring it to extend it to the 15 month period. Um, they are critical hard deadlines that are not able to be extended. Um, thank you. I think that's that's all I was, I'm going to stop the slide presentation. Here we go. Yes, thank you. For, thank you for attending. I, I'm not sure whether there are questions uh, and how that's possible on this sort of a format. I haven't done this before, Amelia. There are a couple of questions actually, Christian. Right. We've been receiving just a couple through from people who've found the, the chat. So we do have a little bit of time, so I will um, read out a couple of those. Um, there's one that jumped out at me that was perhaps relevant to the Court of Appeal uh, judgments that came out uh, well, today that I read about them. Um, but can a court take hardship into account in deciding whether to forfeit assets? Christian. Oh, that's a that's a good question. Yes, the the, um, the Court of Appeal yesterday in Victoria delivered the decision in Aberdeen, <clears throat> and um, and in short, um, I read it this morning. I've, I don't want to misstate anything about it now. Um, but um, Mr. and Mrs. Aberdeen uh, had a, a home which had been forfeited and there was an appeal to the Court of Appeal in relation to whether that property should have been forfeited. And one of the points that was raised on behalf of the Aberdeenies was that they had two children who were going to lose their home. They were the dependents. Um, one, I think, was 17 and one was 19 years old. And, and they argued under Section 72 um, that the trial judge had erred in failing to take into account the level of hardship um, occasioned to the children by the loss of the home. Um, in short, under the Proceeds of Crime Act, there, there are very, very limited, uh, very limited scope for having regard to hardship. Section 72, let me just get my act, provides I think the only avenue in which the court can have regard to any level of hardship, and certainly if you're dealing with automatic forfeiture, there is no, hardship is entirely irrelevant. Um, so when someone's been convicted of a serious offence, questions of hardships just can't arise. Um, but when a forfeiture order is to be made under section 72, the court has the power to relieve certain dependence from hardship. It says this, the court making a forfeiture order specifying a person's property must make another order directing the Commonwealth to pay a spe specified amount to the dependent of the person. Um, if the court is satisfied, the forfeiture order would cause hardship to the dependent. And the question, the principal question in Aberdeen was, what do you have to show to make out hardship? Because as a as a natural incidence of forfeiture, you're going to have hardship. And the cases in Victoria and also in New South Wales that have discussed hardship have come up effectively with this concept that it has to be something more than the usual hardship. It has to be a sort of undue hardship. But at what threshold do you reach that? Anyway, the Court of Appeal found that the evidence was not sufficiently compelling in Abedini to satisfy or well, the, the trial judge was right in rejecting the evidence of hardship because the, um, the there was she wasn't believed about the fact that there were no other assets which could support the family upon the forfeiture of the home. But but it, the hardship cases are difficult because by the very nature of the legislation, and this is what the Court of Appeal said yesterday, the very nature of the legislation is such as to deprive people of property, and that is. A hardship, which is, and if you sought to ameliorate against that, you would undermine the legislation. Okay, um, just jumping on to our next question. Um, what happens to a forfeiture application made by the Commissioner of the AFP if the suspect is later convicted of a serious offence? Well, that, um, that's a common, common uh, incidence. Um, say, for example, the Commissioner obtains uh, a restraining order under section 18. Um, and at that point in time, the suspect is not charged. The commissioner has a certain period of time within which to make a forfeiture application. Yeah. If the commissioner doesn't make the forfeiture application, the restraining order just lapses. But um, if the person is later on charged and convicted, 
then the commissioner no longer needs to run that forfeiture application because forfeiture will happen automatically under section 92 of the act. And in fact, for a petitioner in those circumstances, a petitioner might think I've made an application for exclusion, probably under section 74, because that correlates with a forfeiture order to be made under section 47, which corresponds with the section 18 restraining order. That practitioner after conviction must file another application under, under section 94, seeking to exclude from automatic forfeiture. You must do that. And then you must seek your extension of time because there's almost no prospect that you're going to have that heard and determined within six months, just not possible in a lot of the weight of the, the lists in the court. So, so, so the short answer to that is, I think the forfeiture application will go by the wayside because the commissioner won't want to um, pursue an application that's unnecessary because a conviction has occurred. Okay. Um, just jumping through, I'm just scanning a couple here. Um, this one will probably be particularly relevant to perhaps our next session. And I'll just give people the details of that too, that we're um, hoping to hold our next webinar on the 19th of November at 5 p.m., which Christian will be presenting as well. The topic on that one is restraining orders and first steps for your client. Um, so the question that sort of feeds into that, I think, is, is what are the key timeframes, Christian, that apply under the Proceeds of Crime Act that solicitors should be aware of? I think they're the ones that I said a moment ago like the, the critical ones are revocation application within 28 days mm. auto forfeiture within six months but the other thing is this I, I didn't mention this before it's not a drop dead date but if a section 18 or section 19 restraining order has been on foot for six months the commissioner can apply for for can, can apply for the forfeiture order to be made that is it's a precondition to a forfeiture order so that we're not talking now about automatic forfeiture we're talking about an pre-conviction type forfeiture it's a it, it's a condition that the restraining order has been on foot for six months so if you're acting for somebody in my view you should before the six months expires file an application for exclusion um, that way the court um, knows you intend to uh, challenge the forfeiture of the property and the court won't make the forfeiture application until such time as that application's been determined, but it doesn't stop automatic forfeiture occurring for the reasons I've explained earlier. Yeah. Okay, I think that's almost bringing us to the end. So we will wrap it up. Thank you, Christian, um, so much for your talk today. I really appreciate it. Um, certainly understanding the Proceeds of a Crime Act in terms of strategic phases is a really useful way of looking at this legislation in my point of view. Um, I look forward to you all joining us uh, on the 19th of November uh, at 5 p.m. So um, please re-register if necessary. Otherwise, you should receive the link again um, and we will see you all then. So thank you very much. Thank you.